those of you watching from home with the uh, relaxing of mandates coming along and all of that good stuff, please start thinking about coming back to church and joining in because nothing can replace what we just experienced uh, in person. So uh, come on back. Jump in, the water's fine. <laughs> wow, I'm telling you, I'm ready to preach. But I can't. <laughs> Jody, were you clapping? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm so glad to have Steve Bender with us today. Steve was here about three years ago, and uh, uh, before that, five years before that, and uh, just a, a good friend and really loved his ministry. Steve and his wife, Janelle, served as missionaries to Korea for 14 years. And uh, he has been the Associate uh, Director of Missions for the Baptist Bible Fellowship International for 21 years now. And uh, I know he doesn't look that old. But, uh, I can tell you, because we're both about the same age, we feel it. <laughs> but uh, we've had a good time fellowshipping last night over dinner and um, just, just a real good time. Uh, just sorry we can't spend more time together. He's uh, here in town for just a short uh, period of time. So, Steve, I'm not going to take any more of your time. Come and preach the Amen. word of God to us. All right. Okay. I love you, brother. Thank you. Love you, too. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? You know it's going to be long when I bring my own drink, don't you? <laughs> Did everyone get uh, a blue ribbon? I, I, I've got some help. If you didn't get a blue ribbon, I'd like to, uh, Rachel, I believe it is, right? It has some, raise your hand and she'll, she'll bring you one. <clears throat> I wanted to bring everybody a gift. Uh, since it's been three years since I was here, I wanted to bring you a gift. It's not the least that I could do, but pretty close to it. Uh, <clears throat> but, <laughs> so we're going to just keep your hands up and we'll get you a ribbon. Thank you, Rachel, for doing that. Maybe somebody could even help you do it. You know, that beautiful name of Jesus that we just sang about in a recent poll by George Barna, <clears throat> actually it was published two years ago, that poll said that 47% of millennials, now let me help you to understand or remember what millennials are. We use that term flippantly a lot, but millennials are the age group from 25 to 40 years old are millennials. There are about 71 million living in the United States today. <clears throat> the poll said that 47% of millennials, Christian millennials, let me qualify that even further down, 47% of Christian millennials believe that it is morally wrong to share your faith with someone of a different faith in hopes that they would trust your faith. So what that means is that 47% of Christian millennials living today, and, and I hate to categorize everyone, but that's the poll, that they believe that if I'm a Christian, it's wrong for me to share my faith with you if you're not a Christian in hopes that you will become a Christian. That's pretty sad, isn't it? That, and in fact, it's not just sad, it's very sobering for, for the church today. You know, working in missions, being a missionary in Korea, and now working with missionaries worldwide, I, I think about missions quite a bit and, and what God is doing and the need for missionaries. And, and we all understand the Great Commission as given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the command. That's the mission that God himself through his son Jesus sent us on is to go and tell people about Jesus and who he is and what he did and his death on the cross and that he certainly is the worthy lamb that deserves all honor and praise and glory and worship and we ought to be sharing that faith and we understand that <clears throat> but I'll tell you today the mission force those that are missionaries under the Baptist Bible Fellowship has declined in the last 20 years we've seen that go down there are other 
other organizations that say, <clears throat> I will not name them, but one of them, one of the biggest mission organizations said that for the last 28 years, they have seen a decline in the missions force, while yet we've seen a rise in the population, correct? So our population continues to grow. Those that are going out to tell them about Christ is declining. We're in bad shape. And so the missions office of the Baptist Bible Fellowship, we've devised, uh, not really devised, we've just put together a program called Project 938. <clears throat> and there are some brochures on the uh, welcome desk in the back. Please feel free to take one. Project 938 is simply this. It's uh, taken from Matthew chapter 9 and verse 38 where Jesus said to his disciples, he gave them this prayer request. You know, we take prayer requests and we expect others to pray for it. And Jesus said to his disciples, hey, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would put forth laborers into his harvest. I believe that we're seeing a time in our world today where we need more laborers in the harvest, not just as missionaries that will go to foreign countries, but we need pastors that will, men and women, men, excuse me, men that will step up and say, God has called me in and instituted them as pastors of a local church. We need men and women that will step up and say, hey, I'll teach a Sunday school class. I'll teach a discipleship class. I'll lead others. I'll do things. So we're praying for more laborers, <clears throat> and I gave Pastor Kurt a, a thumb drive with a lot of material on it that on October the 3rd of this year, the missions office is trying to get churches worldwide to join us in a concerted day of prayer that we would pray for more laborers into the harvest on Sunday, October the 3rd. And so that information will be coming. If you'd like one of these brochures, there's a lot of information about our mission office and, and QR codes that you can scan and read all about it. So that, that's enough of the, of the uh, advertisement. I, I wanted to talk to you this morning about, about missions and, and how that we can <clears throat> be involved in missions and do more for the cause of Christ. And I appreciate being invited to your church once again to be able to share this with you. I, I came three years ago and I preached a message, <clears throat> what is your conviction about, uh, about the Great Commission? What is your personal belief? And you remember, if some of you may remember, I buttoned my coat wrong and it looked kind of goofy. And I said, you know, we got to start on the right foundation. And, and that is that we fall and worship ourselves, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we go out into all the world. I, I, I want to uh, remind you this morning. <clears throat> Does anybody know what this is? What is it? The enemy. The enemy. Okay, I, I know. <clears throat> I know that I'm in Duncan Country. All right. <laughs> I understand that. <clears throat> However, Starbucks is the number one coffee company worldwide. You know how they got that way. Well, in January of 2008, Charles or Howard Schultz was the CEO of Starbucks. He had retired uh, from the company. He was sitting back in his easy chair and he began to look around and he watched Starbucks company and he noticed something about them. He said in a statement, he said they had lost their soul in becoming the global giant. So in February of 2008, he came out of retirement. He said, and I quote, pouring espresso is an art, one that requires the barista to care about the quality of the beverage. If the barista only goes through the motions without passion, he or she will produce an inferior espresso. If one does not care, then Starbucks has lost the essence of what we set out to do almost 40 years ago. So on February the 26th of 2008, under the leadership of Howard Schultz, Starbucks closed on February the 26th 7,100 stores worldwide. Every store they had, they shut down for three and a half hours. They did so to retrain 135,000 baristas in the art of of making a cup of coffee. They reopened after those three and a half hours of training with a renewed passion to serve the world a great cup of coffee. 
today, just a few years later. Starbucks has grown from that 7,100 stores in 2008 to over 31,000 stores in 78 different countries of our world, making them the number one coffee chain in the world. Now, I'm not here to endorse Starbucks this morning. What I am here to do is to endorse the fact that if Howard Schultz said, we've lost our soul, we've lost our passion for making a cup of coffee, and the people of the world deserve it. And so he said, I don't care what it costs. I'm going to shut down all 7,100 stores, and we're going to retrain every person, and we're going to instill in them the art of making a cup of coffee. And now they've grown to over 31,000 stores worldwide. I think, what would happen in God's church if, Brother Kurt, if we renewed our passion and said, wait a minute, our world is in dire need. We're in crisis. We're in a pandemic, and it's not from COVID-19. We're in a pandemic that people don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. I was reminded this morning when I walked into your building and I walked in past the reception desk and I looked on the floor and it said one way. And I said, John 14, 6, when Jesus said, I am the one way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, that's our mission, folks. And we've got to get a new passion to reach the people, not just of our world, but right here at home in Burlington, Massachusetts, and all the surrounding cities and spreading out through the world because I don't think we have much longer. I, I don't believe we're going to be here a long time more. And I know I've heard that since I was a little boy growing up in Texas, but it's even more true today than it was then. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to the book of Numbers, chapter 15. In the book of Numbers, chapter 15, beginning in verse number 37. Numbers, chapter 15, and verse 37. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make in them, in them French's... <coughs> Make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go a whoring, but you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. You see, God said to the Moses, he said, Moses, my children, I've told them over and over the things to do, but they seem to be forgetting them. What I want you to tell my children to do is to take and take a ribbon of blue and put it in the hems of their garments, in their sleeves and around the bottoms of their robes, that every time that they raise their arms or sit down and, and they see the bottoms of their, their garments, they see that ribbon of blue, that they're reminded, but not only are they reminded, but that they would do what I told them to do. You ever, as a kid growing up or in years past, have you had somebody tell you, you know, uh, hey, I'm probably going to forget that. They said, well, tie a string around your fingers. Anybody ever, that, that old saying, uh, some of us older folks remember that, but uh, I didn't mean to point you out. But, <laughs> but that comes back from God told Moses. He said, Moses, my people are forgetful. And he said, I want you to tell them to put that hem in their garments, that ribbon of blue, so that every time they see it, they are reminded and they do what I told them to do. This morning, I want to remind you that God told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He told us to, to forget nobody, to go out because they need to know who Jesus Christ is. They need to know what he did. They need to know what he can do in their 
life and for eternity. And you and I have that responsibility. And I believe we need to renew that passion in our own hearts and lives and saying we're not just here for us right now. We're not just here to be separated from the world and, and sit on our couches at home because of COVID or, or physically or socially distanced from everybody else. That's what the world would have you to believe. And I understand the need for that in the physical sense, but way too many Christians have implemented that in their spiritual lives. And we've got to get back that passion to talk to people about their eternity and where they're going to spend it and that they have an opportunity through a choice to receive or reject Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So that's what we are reminded, and that's what we ought to be doing. On May the 30th of 1792, William Carey was a missionary to India. He was considered to be the father of modern missions. And on May the 30th of 1792, he preached a sermon from Isaiah chapter 54 about reaching the lost of this world. In a private conversation with some of his closest friends immediately following the service, he, Carey laid himself figuratively and literally on an altar in front of the building. And he said to those friends around him, he said, I will go down into the pits if you will hold the ropes. There, the Baptist Society for Propagating the Gospel Among the Heathen was formed. That mission was to be supported by personal and individual donations from people. And on June the 13th, just a year later, in 1793, William Carey left for India with his wife and his four children for 40 years of missionary service in India. Wow. What a story. I, I like to read the biographies of those men and the autobiographies of those men and women that gave their lives in the early years to serve Jesus Christ and to propagate the gospel among those that never heard. I think today, as we sing these songs, holy, you are holy, Lord God Almighty. And we enjoy that and we worship our Lord with it. But where is our passion? to take that gospel to those that need to hear. For 2,000 years, faithful men and women have been holding the ropes, so to speak, so that other faithful men and women could devote their lives to full-time service in missions. As I travel around the United States and other places in our world, I'm often asked by people, and in essence, they're saying, where are the William Careys of today? Where are the <clears throat> Hudson Taylors of today? Where are those men and women today that are giving their lives and going out onto the mission fields? And I'll admit, they're fewer and fewer between. But then I'll also say, where are those men and women that will faithfully hold the ropes for those that are going. <clears throat> you see, when I went out as a missionary back in 1984, back, yes, back in the 1900s, <laughs> I went out as a missionary and going from church to church, and we would present our ministry and ask people to pray for us and ask people to support us financially. And in those days, it was taking uh, an average of two years for missionaries to raise their support. Janelle and I prayed, and we said, God, would you give us our support in eight months? Record time, not for anything other than we just needed and wanted to get to the mission field. And, and God gave us that support in 10 months, and, and people began to hold the ropes for us. And, and we began to, to, to go, and, and we could go. And, but today, it's taking our missionaries three and four years to raise enough support to go to the mission field. <clears throat> and I say that's the, re the reason is because there's not enough rope holders here in the United States. Not enough people that'll say, we'll hold the ropes. We'll pray for you, and we'll support you financially. And, and your church gives, you give to missions above your tithe. And it goes into the missions portion of the, of the ministry that you might support those missionaries to go out into all the world. But it, but it takes more than just one person doing it. It takes everybody 
being involved. And those missionaries that you've said, hey, <clears throat> we'll hold the ropes for you as you go to the country that God's called you. I, I brought a rope this morning, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie it around your, your podium here, Brother Kurt. I'm, I'm just as an illustration, perhaps. And <clears throat> this would be like the rope that you folks have said we'll hold for, for our missionaries that have gone out around the world. And, and we'll make sure that, that you get what you need. We'll pray for your needs. And, and we'll pray specifically more than just God bless the missionaries. And, and we'll pray for you by name. And we'll, we'll ask God to provide for what you need. And, and so those men and women are counting on you. I, I, I'm sorry, would you stand and hold this rope for Because you're right here in the front and everybody <laughs> wants to see you. Would you do this on behalf of Heritage Park Baptist Church and the missionaries that this congregation has said, we'll, we'll hold the ropes for you. W would you be happy to do that? Mm -hmm. Would you hold it high so that everybody can, can see? Thank you. I'll try to be done by noon. <laughs> Hold the rope. That's a concept that is woven throughout the Word of God. In Joshua chapter 2 and verse 15, Rahab the harlot. I, I need you to hold it high. <laughs> Rahab the harlot let a Jewish spy down through a window on a wall by a cord or a rope. And Rahab became the mother of Boaz. She's in the messianic line of Jesus Christ himself. In Joshua chapter 2, or in 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 12, Michael, the daughter of Saul, led a Jewish shepherd down through a window by a rope, and he became the next king of Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 38 and verse 6, Jeremiah was let down into a pit by a rope to die. But if you read further in verse 13, his faithful friends pulled him out of the pit with a rope and spared his life. Can you hold it high? <laughs> Thank you. I mean, you're holding it for the whole church, for everybody here. I'm sorry? I think I need help. You need help? I'm sorry. No. Oh, oh we have a volunteer. Whenever you're done. Thank you. Hold the rope. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 25, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 33, Paul the apostle was let down through a window over the wall in a basket by a rope by his faithful friends to save his life. The rope handlers in the word of God, they weren't brave or mighty men. Most of them, we don't even know their names. They were just men and women that did what God wanted them to do. They did what was necessary. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, because you kind of ruined my illustration, but... <laughs> why, why did you ask for help? Because my arm was getting tired. Your arm was getting tired? Yeah. <laughs> of, of course it was. <laughs> I knew that it would <laughs> because one person can't do it all by themselves. Mm. And you were moving before she said, I need help. You were edging on your seat and you said, I don't know if I should go or not. <laughs> but you volunteered, didn't you? Sure. You volunteered and said, I could help. And several others probably thought the same thing, but I don't know what held, holds us back. Sometimes we think, well, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't know what to do. But I'll help. You see, God takes volunteers. And that's what it takes in ministry and in life. Men and women that will just say, <clears throat> God, here am I. Why is our world suffering today? Why is our mission force declining? Because people are sitting back and saying somebody else will do it. But we've got men and women that will say, I'll do what you ask me to do, and I'll volunteer to do more. Thank you, folks. Thank you. 
That's, that's how this ministry and this church and the Word of God gets spread around the world. God needs rope holders. Could I just give you a very quick illustration this morning of how you can hold the ropes as Heritage Baptist Church for your missionaries? Let's just think about the word rope, R-O-P-E. First of all, the R. You see, you can hold the rope by investing your resources, the resources that you have of your time to say, I'll get involved, I'll help, like this lady in the back and this gentleman and this here that said, I'll, I'll do whatever needs to be done, and I'll do it without even asking. Or if I'm asked, maybe you're the type that, like me, sometimes I just don't even think about it. But when I'm asked, I said, why didn't I think about that? Of course I'll do it. We can resource our, the resource of our time and our efforts. The Sunday school classes of this church, the ministries that God needs people to fulfill, the mission where God needs people that will say, God, here am I. Send me. I'll go to Korea. I'll go to Africa. I'll go to Spain. God, I'll go wherever you want. We can also invest the resource of our finances. Our finances is an obvious thing. And you say, well, <clears throat> I knew you were going to get to that sooner or later. But you know what? It's like a bottle of water. How many people buy bottled water here? Several of us, probably all of us at one time or another have bought a bottle of water. Did you know that water is free? <laughs> Did you know that? You can go to any lake or stream or river and you can get water. You can go to a well and get water for free. Why do we pay for it? You know what we pay for? We're not really paying for the water. We're paying for the, for the cost of getting the water to us. <clears throat> the processing of it, <clears throat> excuse me, and the bottling of it and getting it to us to drink. We're paying for the process. Missions is not, you're not paying missionaries to go and just live on a mission field. You're investing your funds. You're investing your funds in the process to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that need to hear it. That's what missions giving is all about. And missions giving is really not ever about money. It's always about our heart. If our heart's right, we don't have a problem giving our money. If our heart is moved with compassion for people that need Jesus Christ, if our heart is moved with a passion to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not a problem for invest that resource of money into sending out missionaries. So that's one way we can hold the ropes for our missionary. The other way is opportunities. The O of rope would be the opportunities. God needs people. Yet not because he needs us, but he's chosen to use people to send his message to the world. He's chosen to use you and I and people that will say, God, I'll, I'll, I'll invest. I'll, I'll, I'll give my time. God, I will volunteer. I'll step out of my seat at the, at the risk of being embarrassed, at the risk of ruining an illustration because I don't know where it's going, but my friend needs help. I know that she can't continue to hold the rope because, you see, I know what she's been through as well and is still going through. But when I asked her, would she hold the rope? She didn't know what I was going to ask, but she willingly stood and said, whatever. Whatever you need, God. The opportunities. I was reminded, I, I, I was on a conference call two weeks ago with the chief of chaplains of the armed forces of the United States of America in the Pentagon, and there were about 10 of us on that phone call. There was a gentleman on the call, and he said, it came out that he was a Marine. And he said, how did you become a Marine? The chief of chaplain asked him. And he said, well, he said, you know, I went into the Air Force recruiter, and I sat down, and the Air Force recruiter said, hey, I could offer you this incentive. I could give you this. I could make sure you get this school and this opportunity. And he said, then I went to the Army, and the Army gave me pretty much the same spiel. And I can offer you this. I can give you this school. I can send you to this uh, duty station. And then he said, I went into the Marine Corps' office, and I sat down in front of the Marine Corps recruiter, and I said, what do you have to offer? He said, what? 
He said, the Air Force and the Army offered me this. And he said, that recruiter stood up and he said, son, I have, I will offer you the opportunity to earn the right to become a United States Marine. And he said, that's all it took. We live in this society today that everybody's looking for a handout for something. You know what God says? I think he wants people that'll say, God, I want to earn the right to be your servant. God, I want to earn the right to take your word, the most precious thing in the world, of those that need to hear it. We can hold the ropes by seizing the opportunities, by joining our missionaries on the mission field. The P of rope would stand for prayer. Missionaries need our prayer. I've preached on that particular topic here several years ago, praying for your missionaries, praying specifically You see, when you were going through your treatments, it boosted you, it helped you, it encouraged you to know that your fellow friends were praying for you by name. And she counted on that. And you as well have been through times in your life when people said, God bless you, I'll pray for you. And you wanted them to pray specifically for the needs that you had. Mm -hmm. Our missionaries need your prayers. You know why? Because they're faced with the same temptations from Satan that you are. They have the same marital problems that you have. They say the same financial problems that you have. They have the same problems with pornography and the internet and all of the things that you are presented with. They have the same problems with their children that you have. They need your prayers. They are not superheroes. Even though we often call our missionaries heroes and we, we thank, we're thankful for the fact that they give up living in the United States to take the gospel sometimes to very difficult places in our world. But you know what? They're just doing what God's called them, them to do just like you, only in different parts of the world. So if our missionaries will say, I'll give my life to go to the Middle East and I'll take it to to a world that's not conducive to Christianity, that doesn't like us. In fact, they hate us and they don't want us there. And, And I may lose my life, but God's called me. And the people need it. And so I'll go. And They need your prayers earnestly consistently praying for them. The E of rope would stand for eternal rewards. For the eternal rewards. You see, they don't go just for nothing. They go that they might say, I know that you have a belief system. I know that you've trusted in something else all your life, whatever that God may be. But I'm here to tell you about the one true God who is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody will get to the Father but by Him. And when they understand, and when they make that personal choice to say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. God, I know that there's no way I can save myself. No matter what God I've been trusting in all my life, God, I know, I understand that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. And that after three days, he rose from the grave and he's in heaven today, just waiting for that moment when the father says, son, It's time. Go get my kids, and the rapture will take place. And those of us that have trusted in Jesus Christ will be taken out of this world. And those that have not will be left behind. What a sad thought. 
Think of your family that doesn't yet know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Think about your friends, your neighbors. Forget the people around the world you've never met. Forget about them. Just think about the ones that you could reach. And they will stand with you in eternity at the judgment seat. And they'll either say, thank you. Thank you for telling me about Jesus Christ. Or they will say, why did you not tell me? What stopped you? You knew Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you never told me. Why not? Howard Schultz said, it's important that we make a great cup of coffee because that's what people want. And they became the largest coffee company in the world. Jesus said, forget what they want. Give them what they need. Give them my name so that they might trust in me. Father, this morning, God, you know our hearts. Lord, speak to us, challenge us, and change us today. For we ask it in your name.